Welcome back to the Pool Pro Podcast, episode number 14. On today's episode, we have James Ambergy, UNC professor and researcher, as he talks about filtration science. You thought you knew everything, but you don't. Welcome back to the Pool Pro Podcast. This is Michelle Cavanaugh, and then our co-host, Dave Rockwells. Hey, Dave. Good morning. Good morning. Very excited today because we have James Ambergy, who is a professor at UNC Charlotte and also a scientist who has done lots of studies on filtration science. He's actually presented at the World Aquatic Health Conference. If you have not seen his presentation from the 2018 World Aquatic Health Conference in, Char in Charleston, you are missing out. And that video is actually on the CPSA website for viewership for people that are members of CPSA. So if you go to thecpsa.org and become a member, you have access to that video immediately when you set up an account. James, thank you so much for being here this morning. We appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And we're gonna talk about filtration science today. Dave and James are gonna have a wonderful conversation about this. <laughs> you know, I've never been a service guy, so I will admit the fact that I, I can't talk filtration science like the best of them. So I'm going to let Dave um, work his magic on uh, things he wants to ask James about filtration. Welcome, James. Thanks for being on. Yeah, th thank you. Um, I, I was really impressed with the, uh, the discussion at the World Aquatic Health Conference. I want to say that anybody who hasn't heard it, that alone is worth the price of admission to, uh, to join CPSA. But what you did there and what, what your, uh, your, your studies, your science does, is makes people think about filtration uh, maybe a little deeper and, and beyond what, what most of us are used to in my world, in the service and, and construction end of things. Um, we, we don't look at things that, that closely. And so, um, we kind of have a tendency to just do what we've always done. Uh, we all have our favorite filters, be it cartridge, sand, DE, uh, a lot of it's regional. And so what I was hoping that we could maybe do is spend a little time and, and kind of give a breakdown and get your thoughts on, on filtration and what are the issues that we could, should consider when we're recommending a filter for a pool that we're gonna service or, or build. Okay. Well, let, let me uh, start by trying to trying to piss everybody off and, and say that, you know, we, if we're filtering water in a pool, we're doing it wrong. Uh, and we've been doing it wrong for about 50 years now. So, you know, unless you learned how to build and design pool filters more than 50 years ago, uh, you know, you, you're, you're probably uh, going to need to make some serious changes. Uh, we, we use sand filters in drinking water treatment and, and they work wonderfully well. But we don't use them the same way in swimming pools. So when you go from drinking water to swimming pools, you, you filter the water about four to five times faster. You, you don't add a coagulant and the bed depth is about a third as deep. So basically all the things that make a sand filter work in drinking water, we don't do in swimming pools and therefore sand filters don't work in swimming pools. They're just there for clarity. They don't remove pathogens, uh, whether it's protozoans or bacteria. You know, they're, they're just there to make the pool look good. And that's what we've been doing for about 50 years. Um, you know, cartridge filters, uh, you know, they, they suck equally bad to, to a sand filter for similar reasons. We've got good cartridge filters. We just don't use them in swimming pools because they would clog very rapidly. So there, there is good cartridge filter technology but that's not what you're going to see in a swimming pool. We're going to have, you know, 30 micron pores, and then we're going to have particles that are one to five microns. And uh, that's going to that's going to make them work uh, okay for clarity and do nothing for the for the pathogens, and that, that can cause you know disease and outbreaks. Um, DE filters, uh, you know, DE is kind of hard to dispose of, so I'm going to talk about DE filters as perlite filters because you can use perlite in a, in a DE filter and just say that, you know, it's probably the, the, uh, the easiest one to get to work properly of the three, because you can, you can change the DE that you put in, you can change the amount of DE, and you can change the way you operate it and design it. So it, it's probably the most uh, amenable 
to, to doing good pathogen removal in pools. But if you follow NSF guidelines, uh, it, it probably won't work worth a damn. And you also need to operate them properly or the, or the media will fall off and leave uh, kind of holes in the filter. So th there's a lot of problems with pool filters, and, uh, and I'm sure we'll circle back to these in more detail, but uh, just, just trying to get everybody's attention. Yep. That, that's what I would like to do is maybe we could take each one of these filters individually. But the one thing I'll say that, that I agree with you is uh, in our education, uh, filtration is exactly that what you described. It's used for water clarity. We use chlorine uh, supplemental sanitizers now like ozone, UV, AOP. Um, those are the, the main tools for killing and removing pathogens for the from the water and and the the uh, filtration is really just about clarity in the, in the water and so what what I'm hearing you saying is that we could be doing a lot more with pool filtration yeah absolutely we can we can filter pools correctly I mean we can do a much better job of, of removing pathogens because the, the simple truth is every pool has a filter Every pool doesn't have an ozone system. You know, every pool doesn't have a UV system. You know, and until they do, <laughs> we should probably try to make filters work. Uh, and that, that's that's my my thinking anyway. So the cartridge filters that we have available to us, and the other thing that I will say, I haven't been around 50 years, but I ran around 30 years, and the filtration technology, really even the, the filters themselves, haven't changed much. The, the, pretty much the same models that were available when I started in the business are, are what we're using now. There hasn't been much in the way of advancements. Yeah, and filtration is, has come a long way. Uh, you know, it's just that the, the pool industry hasn't embraced it. I mean, if you look at the NSF standards, which these filters are kind of tested and, and regulated by, I mean, 20... 20 some percent performance is all they're after. So if, if the filter can get, you know, 22 percent removal of large particles uh, five times, you know, it passes the NSF uh, uh, 50 test. And that's that's pathetic, you know, and, and it's pathetic that NSF will will keep the same test for 50 years and not update it because uh, they're, they're worried about offending somebody or that things won't be the same. I mean, they didn't work 50 years ago. I mean, all they did was clarity. That's all anybody cared about 50 years ago was clarity. But now we've got real problems. We've got outbreaks. You know, we, we've got cryptosporidium, which is chlorine resistant. I mean, if we don't remove this thing, it's gonna it's gonna cause outbreaks. It's gonna make people sick. And so we gotta we gotta change with the times and improve the way we filter pools. So maybe let's let's start with cartridge filters. Um, are you saying that they're pretty much of no value other than for just water clarity, or are there some things we can do to make them work better? Um, what, what would you yeah, say? Well, yeah, good question. Um, so most uh, most of the cartridge filters that are used in pools and spas are have about 30 micron holes, and pretty much any pathogen that we're interested in removing, like cryptosporidium, is five microns or smaller. You know, pretty much all bacteria is one micron or smaller. And a lot of these protozoan pathogens are five or eight microns, but you're not gonna remove them with a 30 micron filter. And and that's, you know, the limitation. Now they make uh, one micron and five micron cartridges, but those aren't the ones you get for pools. Um, and they don't use them on pools because they would clog rapidly. And people don't want to go, you know, start cleaning filters uh, every day or every other day or something. They, they want them to last for a month or so. And they, they will last for a month if they're not removing anything. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so the, the desire is actually the problem. <laughs> if you want a maintenance-free filter, just get one that doesn't work. <laughs> you won't have to clean it or change it or anything. Well, I just spent... Uh, the last three days cleaning filter cartridges for uh, a route that I'm involved with. And um, the most pool guys, if they get cleaned every six months, they're, they're doing well. 
a lot, a lot of times it's even a once a year uh, process. Is that it's it's all about what the homeowner can afford and is willing to pay for as well. So um, after six months or a year, they do accumulate a lot of dirt. I will say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and they probably grow things on them and stuff too in that amount of time. So, yeah. but you know, if you wanted to do cartridge filters. Uh, you know, better, I would actually recommend a two-stage cartridge filter where you had a, a 30 micron pre-filter and then maybe you had a five micron post-filter. And that way you, you could yeah. you could remove the crypto uh, with the second filter and then not clog it crazy fast. But, you know, that would require twice as many filter elements and, and twice as many filters. And then, you know, you got to decide, you know, for a homeowner, do they, do they want to do that? Or, you know, does a potentially a hotel, motel, uh, community pool, uh, can they afford not to do that? Right. You know, can they afford not to filter in a way that's going to, you know, prevent outbreaks and uh, avoid, you know, people getting sick or potentially dying? So, um, yeah, lots of lots of decisions to make. Uh, so, you can also add a DE or perlite to a cartridge filter. But once again, it's going to it's going to clog. Uh, faster, and you're going to have to replace the DE or perlite than like you would a, a DE or perlite uh, pre coat filter. And, it, and, it, I, and I actually got that tip or trick from the uh, from the Pentair instruction manual. It says <laughs> if this filter isn't performing up to your standard, just throw a little perlite in there, <laughs> and, and it works. <laughs> yeah, the problem with that is uh, finding a place to clean it because over the years that that. Uh, DE or perlite accumulates and you have a real mess on your hands uh, after a while. So that's the other thing about any, any kind of a filter with a removable element is finding a place where you can, you can dispose of all the stuff you wash off of it. Yeah. Yeah, that can be a challenge. I mean, particularly for DE because you can't dispose of it in a sewer because it'll settle out and clog the lines. Yeah, uh, but with with perlite, you know, it's generally considered sewer safe. So as long as you're at a place where you can wash it to a drain, yeah. uh, you know, perlite's probably a lot lot better. So then maybe we'll we'll let that be our transition to DE filters. Um, <clears throat> a DE filter is, as far as its rating, is the smallest micron size. It, it traps the smallest particles, but uh, what are the some of the issues involved with DE? You're not always getting the best performance out of these filters, from what I understand. Yeah, yeah, very, very true. Uh, there are a number of a number of issues, but but let me let me vent on your your description of a DE filter and micron ratings. Um, you know, filters are are really not absolute uh, sieves. They they don't have one micron holes in them. <laughs> you know that it's not the kind of thing where it's just black or white or all or none. I mean, cartridge filters have multiple size holes. Uh, in in fact, it's kind of a weave that the water is going through. And and the um, and the matrix for DE or perlite is usually about an eighth of an inch thick. You know, it's not just like a sheet of paper. It's not a membrane. Uh, so you know, whatever you you have, it's not an absolute. And to say that. A filter filters down to one micron, which is a term or a phrase that I've heard, you know, at least a, a hundred times over the years. I mean, I would say any filter will filter down to one micron. I mean, any filter that does any type of filtration is probably eventually randomly going to have a one micron particle stick to something. You know, so I mean, when you say, oh, filters down to one micron, I'm hearing you know, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. <laughs> you know, th there aren't any one micron filters in pools, uh, you know, and, and to say that it filters down to just means that it has no efficiency at the level where you actually want it to work. You know, if you, if you want to have a filter that you make a claim about, say, oh, it removes 99% of one micron particles. Uh, you got my attention then, you got something that works. When you say it filters down to one micron, you're just uh, spinning the uh, marketing bullshit, you know, and I don't appreciate it. Uh, well, but you were asking about uh, perlite uh, and <laughs> and DE filters. Uh, so I would say that, uh, you know, if you follow the NSF guidelines and the manufacturer guidelines, 
that's typically for uh, 10 pounds of DE per 100 square feet. And that's probably not enough for most filters. So what NSF is requiring, what the states are requiring, and, and what the manufacturers are requiring is probably too little media. So in, in my research, uh, you know, I, I've seen uh, filters go from, you know, pretty mediocre, poor performance at removing, you know, crypto up to over 99% by just changing from, from 10 pounds to 15. Mm. So 15 pounds of DE or 7.5 pounds of perlite per 100 square feet is, is the amount of media that you need to add. If, if you want to get good pathogen removal. So even if you're using a DE filter uh, and you're using perlite in it, if you're not using the right amount, it, it's not going to work properly. Uh, second thing is if you stop the flow through the filter. So you, you've got all the pre-coat media onto your grid and you're filtering, and then you stop the flow. The, the media will fall off. And then when it when you start the flow back, it'll recoat, but it won't recoat evenly. So you're going to have thin spots and thick spots and all that kind of thing, and, and it's just going to be a mess, and the filter's not going to be efficient. Well, that's so important. you have to avoid flow interruptions, and you have to use the right amount of media if you want a DE filter to, to work. Go ahead, Dave. Nobody, nobody runs their filter 24 hours a day. They, I mean, a lot of areas of the country still use single-speed pumps, and they only... Uh, oversized single speed pumps and they only run maybe four hours a day, four to six hours a day. So um, literally every day that that happens. Yeah, in commercial pools, a lot of times they're required for 24 hour, 24 hour operation. Uh, right. But yeah, for your home pool, you, you can run it whenever. I actually had a professor a friend here at the university and, uh, you know, he, he was saying his, his filter wasn't really working very well. And he knew I was a filtration guru, so he, he was asking me for some pointers, and he had a, a DE filter. I said, well, uh, do you have any media in it? He was like, you mean it's not in there? <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that's where the conversation started. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, people are probably running these things, and they think that cloth uh, support media is the filter. You know, and, and so, yeah. I mean, the, the the average homeowner probably doesn't know a whole lot about filtration or not only do you not need the right amount of media, but they don't even know that you need media. Yeah. And, you know, they could be washing it out or, you know, or, or they may think when they take it apart and spray it off with a hose and wash all the media out that they've cleaned it, you know, and they may not know they need to add more. So, yeah, I would think there could be a lot of things uh, on the education front that people could learn about uh, pre-coat filters, uh, for sure. And I, I've uh, experimented with both perlite and DE, and perlite seems to solve a lot of the problems that, that DE has. One of them is, is bridging, where the DE just eventually, after several months, clumps in the, in the middle between the grids, and you just have a solid mass in there. Um, when you open a DE filter after six months or a year, it, it's a grab bag. You you don't know what you're going to see. Um, sometimes it's really nicely coated on the outside of the grid. Sometimes you can tell that filter hasn't been working for a long time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if all the water is going through spots that don't have any media because the media is all clumped into one corner or one edge and it's not evenly distributed, I mean, that's exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about here. I mean, when you turn the flow on and off and you don't recoat evenly and you're not doing like a slurry feed or something, uh, you're not going to get that nice even coating. So, you know, a, a pre-coat filter might not be a good choice if you're going to operate four hours a day and you're not going to change the media. So, uh, you know, th there may be better uh, filter choices. But, you know, you, you, you also said that, you know, you open this filter up after six months. Well, damn, that's, that's a big problem in and of itself. You know, you open <laughs> any filter up after six months of not cleaning it, and, you know, it's not going to be pretty. Right. And, uh, you know, I think maintenance is a, is a real big issue. I mean, you know, the inside of filters are by, by nature yucky, and nobody wants to really get in there and clean them. Yeah. But, you know, uh, a good drinking water filter is probably going to be cleaned or backwashed, you know, 
every 48 to 72 hours. Uh, you know, you don't want stuff sitting in there for months, you know, growing, yeah. <laughs> you know, and sliming up and, you know, doing all the things that'll, that'll happen. So, yeah, okay. ma filter maintenance is real important. You know, a lot of people have opened up sand filters to find there isn't any sand in it. They've, uh, they've washed out all the sand. Oh, my. Or that it's turned into cement. So, yeah, f filter maintenance is uh, is critical. Now, the other thing about DE is w once you backwash a DE filter, all bets are off. You, you don't know what's inside that. You don't know how much DE's left, uh, how much to put back in. Yeah, well, I mean, you would hope that if you backwash it, you backwash out all the media. But as you're saying, that's not always a given. I mean, with, with sand filters and, and pre-coat filters, um, a lot of times the backwash guidelines aren't, uh, aren't sufficient. I mean, in particular, you know, when we're talking about sand filters, uh, you know, you, you should probably backwash them a lot faster than you filter them. And in drinking water treatment, that's about a factor of five. You usually filter about four gallons a minute per square foot and backwash it about 20. Mm -hmm. But with uh, swimming pools, we, we typically use the exact same rate. So if we filter at 15, we backwash at 15, which means the filter won't work and the backwash won't work. And so sometimes when we simplify things, we, we get them too simple. We make them too easy. And it just uh, kind of totally defeats the technology. And you know, if, if you're backwashing a, a DE filter, uh, you know, per perlite will backwash out easier, and, and that will also kind of kind of help with that. But yeah, DE tends to be quite heavy and hard to hard to wash out. Good point. Right. Do you so think, so, Dave? Dave uh, sorry, to interrupt, Dave, but I was going to sure. say, do you think we you know the goal with this particular podcast is to try to raise the professionalism and the you know the the standard for service guys? And I think I think a lot of times, from what I've heard from different service guys and the things that I've seen the different times we do webinars and things is that they, you know, they're not doing a contract with their homeowners to say, you know, you can sell cleaning the filter more often if it's a part of your contract and what you're trying to accomplish. And I, I don't think it's always based on price. And I think the mistake a lot of service guys make is that they assume that everything is based on price. And I think a homeowner knowing that their filter would be clean, it's protecting their family, where whatever amount of how, the frequency, whatever the frequency needs to be to make it, you know, work better and to actually, you know, help in this way. Don't you just make that part of your contract and then you sell the contract for whatever price it is. I think if you're always trying to, you know, when you said, you said, Dave, yourself that the homeowner may not want to pay for it, but if you make it part of your contract and what your, what the overall goal for the system is in the backyard and what the service guy is trying to accomplish to keep the family safe and healthy, wouldn't that be part of it? Isn't that the goal to do that? Yeah, and, and I think that that's a big part of it is is for us as service professionals to educate ourselves on the need for this. Yeah. Um, you know, we've, we've, again, we do so many things because we've always done it that way. And exactly. that once a year fil filter cleaning, we may be doing because that's the way the person who trained us in the industry does it. Um, but I, I'm very intrigued by what James is saying about the importance of cleaning filters off and getting that stuff out of there. I would, I would say maybe all you have to do is let the homeowner see one time what the filter looks like after six months and it may be an easier sell to, um, to get them yeah. to do it more often. But uh, as James also pointed out, it's not a real pleasant job. It's not a, it's not a fun yes. job. And so um, they, read, they need just need the right terminology or the right, information yes. to be able to sell it to the homeowner. Maybe they don't know enough to be able to say to the homeowner, this is how often you need to do it. And given, given the right information, maybe that's just part of their, their normal maintenance routine and the frequency is whatever the frequency is recommended. But I mean, I think they may not know what to say or they don't know how to sell it in that way or, or you know what I mean? Yep, I do. That's the key, so. Um, so, the, the I would that's the two filters we've discussed up till now the DE and the cartridge are probably the most labor intensive for the for the pool service person um, over the over the course of the year or the yearly maintenance. Um, but w something that I wish that was a little more popular here in California that I'd like to talk a little to get James talking about now is the sand filtration. 
Um, I think it's it's the the standard in in a lot of areas of the country, but it's something that's just never caught on here. And so, um, I, I'd like uh, James to kind of fill us in with people who don't haven't used it much. Um, Tell us about the advantages and what, what we, why we should be using sand filters. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, advantages, you know, uh, cartridge filters tend to be kind of, you know, somewhat disposable in that, you know, you, you kind of run them until they clog or foul so bad you can't use them anymore, then you throw them away and get a, and get a new one. Um, and, you know, and that, that's not a real kind of green approach. And kind of the same thing is true of, of pre-coat filters. You know, each time you backwash the filter, you're, you're throwing the media away and you're putting new media in, you know, and there, there's an environmental uh, impact to both of those. Uh, you know, sand filters uh, are different in that they, they actually reuse the same media over and over and over. And, and that's typically a good thing, and that's typically the way that uh, drinking water is treated. Uh, we uh, we can do sand filtration extremely efficiently, uh, but that wasn't always the case. I mean, if you think back to, to 1993, there was a, a huge uh, waterborne disease outbreak in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where over 400,000 people got sick because we weren't filtering properly. We were filtering the water through a sand filter. We were coagulating the water. We were using the right rates. But uh, the regulations changed from just doing these things to doing them well. So after the 93 outbreak, drinking water uh, started actually monitoring individual filter performance to make sure these things were being done properly, and in particular, coagulation. Because uh, coagulation will change with the water quality in drinking water. And, um, and so we've, we've done a lot of research here at the university to figure out how to do coagulation properly. And they're doing coagulation with sand filters, with pool filters uh, all over the world. In fact, the United States is probably the only place that isn't. Uh, so we're, we're very much behind what the rest of the world is doing in, in pools, but there are several things that we can do to make uh, sand filters uh, perform uh, properly in terms of removing uh, pathogens and preventing outbreaks. Uh, you know, we, we need about 24 inches of sand but most smaller filters usually only have about 10 or 12 inches. And sometimes uh, they measure, I'm sorry? You're talking bed depth. Yeah, bed depth. And, and I'm not only talking bed depth, a lot of times manufacturers will misrepresent their products. They'll say uh, this has 24 inches of media, and it may, but the, the point where the water goes out through the laterals, it may be eight inches above the bottom of the filter. And horizontal filters do this notoriously. You know, all the sand below the laterals is not used. You know, it may be there, but it's just being stagnant and growing biofilm. I mean, it's actually a nuisance. So ho horizontal sand filters are, are probably a real, real bad thing. And even vertical sand filters, if they have a round bottom with laterals, you know, they're not going to use the full bed depth. But we need 24 inches of usable bed depth and we need to slow these things down from 15 gallons a minute per square foot to less than 10 gallons a minute per square foot. And if we do those two things and we add a coagulant, uh, and you can add polyaluminum chloride at, uh, at 0 0.1 uh, milligrams of aluminum per liter, and that's, you know, that, that's a tenth of a part per million. I mean, it's a really small dose of coagulant, but it'll make those filters uh, remove particles extremely well because they won't have a charge on them. See, the problem with, with sand filters is the sand is negatively charged and the particles in the pool are negatively charged. So the, the filter that you're trying to filter things out with is actually repelling the particles you're trying to remove. <laughs> and that's why they don't work. Um, and the coagulant kind of fixes that problem. So once you get rid of the charge on the particles, then you can you can filter efficiently, and that's the way sand filters are designed to be used. Now, are there any alternatives to aluminum as far as a coagulant? Uh, yeah, iron. You can use iron as a coagulant. So yeah, drinking water treatment sense. plants kind of use iron and aluminum interchangeably. Okay. Um, 
there are also and there are alternatives in I'm sorry to interrupt you, Dave. Uh, there are alternatives in terms of media. That's what you I was know, going. You can That's actually, exactly where I was going. Oh, good, good. So yeah, <laughs> you can actually use uh, an ultra fine ceramic media, and you won't need coagulant. So if you don't want to use coagulant at all, you can use a very fine ceramic media. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I talk about this in my presentations of some of the ones that we've tested here in the lab. Uh, but you can get uh, 24 inches of a fine ceramic, and if you filter it 10 gallons a minute per square foot, uh, you know, you can get uh, well over 90% uh, crypto removal. Um, yeah. So, yeah, wow. you got two options there, one of using coagulant and one of using uh, ceramic media. Now, this is an engineered ceramic media, um, and, and the media is kind of spherical and rough, so, I mean, it's designed for filtration. You know, it's, it's a man-made material. We're not just taking a, a special type of sand or something. I mean, this is a, uh, a special engineered material that you fire in a kiln and, uh, you know, uh, actually designed for filtration. Is this relatively new on the market? I'm only just starting to see things about this. Um, well, ceramics, uh, you know, uh, ceramic materials have been around for thousands of years. You know, pottery is, you know, basically, you know, ceramic material. But anytime you take a, a clay and, and you and you uh, make something, you know, shape something out of clay and you fire it in a, in a kiln or an oven, uh, you know, to get the moisture out, you know, you, you're making ceramics. And this is the same process that, that they use for that. So in, in general, it's a very kind of safe process, but it's a little more labor intensive than just, you know, taking sand and sieving it. So ceramics tend to be just a little bit more expensive, which you know is not really a problem for a homeowner where they where they may need fifty dollars worth of media, but right. you know it could be a big problem you know if you needed ten thousand pounds of this stuff, mm. you know it, it would never outbid sand. It would never be cheaper than dirt. <laughs> so <to speak. laughs> yes. So. Uh, so yeah, ceramics uh, have been around. Uh, you know, we use ceramic membranes uh, all, in all sorts of industries. So, uh, you know, so we, we've done ceramics filtration for for a long time. Uh, these medias have been around in drinking water for a while, but they typically, because they're a little more expensive, they're only used when sand is not working right. So, uh, so yeah, I would say they've been around, but in swimming pools, they they haven't really been around. They they haven't been around that market. Because uh, you know they're just not going to be cheaper, right? Um, okay. So unless you're looking for better performance, uh, you know, you're right. not and that, I think better. that's what we're trying to get to is we are looking for you know the yes. best ways to improve filter performance on our swimming pools. So um, mm -hmm. that that sounds like something that holds a lot of promise. Um, what what are your opinions on uh, zeolite uh, glass media? Uh, as far as the other options we have? Sure. Uh, well, the, uh, to start with, uh, with, uh, with zeolite, it, it, you know, I've tested zeolite that's the same size as sand, and it performs just like sand. Uh, so, so basically, you know, it's just a different type of material of the same size as sand that works like sand. Okay. Uh, so, I don't have anything against it, you know. It's just, it's just not a magic bullet, you know. It's not going to save yeah. the save the world, and some of it will actually remove hardness, so it could like pull the calcium out of the water because there's some ion exchange capacity in there. So okay. you could actually put in zeolite and suck all the calcium out of your water, and then maybe corrode your equipment and stuff. Yeah, so you may want to be a little careful, um, you know, as, as to what type you use and and to make sure that you monitor hardness if if you're using. Okay. Uh, glass, on the other hand, uh, I really like glass media, but when it's the same size as filter sand, it works just like filter sand. So it's not not a better performer. I mean, it performs almost identical. But the thing I like about it is it's a little bit easier to clean. Yeah. So you can you can clean it uh, with a slightly lower backwash rate, and it cleans a little easier because the surface is is not quite as rough. Uh, uh, I'm talking to the folks uh, that make the, uh, the 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 engineered glass material about doing doing some testing on that, but that testing hasn't been done yet. So this act, active uh, uh, filter media that they they activate the surfaces in different ways. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm talking with a company about maybe doing some research uh, and testing some, some new medias. But so far, the glasses and the zeolites that I've tested that are the same size as sand perform just like sand. Okay. Can I ask a question, James? When I, when I hear this all the time, too, how do you, what do you say to those people who say, yeah, well, James is doing all these tests on these different filters, but he's doing it in a lab. It's not real world application. So you can't really translate that to real world, real world application. And I've heard that not just on this particular type of study, but other studies, chemistry and different things where people have done studies in different ways. And then all of a sudden they say, yeah, that's just not real world. You can't translate that into the marketplace. How, what do you say to that when people say, yeah, James doesn't know, he, he it works in his lab. But if I try to do that in the field, it's not going to have the same result or it's not going to have, you know, what do you say to that? Well, I mean, a couple things are true. Uh, and, and one of those is, you know, I can produce the best case or worst case scenario in the laboratory. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I mean, essentially, if I wanted to, I could make any filter succeed or fail, uh, you know, if the conditions were, were right to do that. So, so I'm very careful to simulate uh, real world conditions, you know, I, when I when I start a filter experiment, I, I start with tap water, you know, I don't start with like ultra pure water or something. You know, I, I do it just like any other person would in terms of hardness, alkalinity and pH, you know, and because it's tap water, it has the same natural organic matter that would that would normally be in a pool. And we've actually made, uh, you know, and tested different types of uh, sweat and urine analogs to put organics into the water you know, just like to simulate people swimming in the pools. We've tested the particle sizes and things that we, that we add for when we add particles to these that, so that they're the same size. And actually, you know, if you want to talk about, you know, shitty testing, let, let's talk about NSF, you know, because <laughs> they actually test with uh, particles that are much larger yeah. than, than you would find in the real world. And they're only testing for 70% removal after five tries. So that they take these huge ass particles, <laughs> and then they they test them uh, to a standard of 70% after five tries, which comes out to I think 21% performance. You know, so I mean, yeah, just because you run a test doesn't mean it's real world. I, I would say the NSF tests are as far from real world as you can get. Mm. Um, but the thing is, you know, in the lab, I can test best case scenario. You know, I, I can test best case scenario, and if that doesn't work. They ain't nothing going to work. Right. And and that's what I would say to those people that would criticize lab research is, you know, I mean, if you think sand filters are just going to work because you add a bunch of dirt and gunk and things to them, no, they're going to perform worse. You know, I mean, right. if you take a, a dirty filter that hasn't been cleaned in six months, it's not going to be better <laughs> than a clean one. You know, it, it's going to be worse. Right. And and I've heard people say that, you know, I've had, actually had people say, well, you know, sand filters get better with time once they start to clog up a little bit, you know, and you don't want to backwash them too much and stuff. You know, you'll get all the dirt and stuff in there out and then they won't work as good. And uh, I've tried to test that and I can't find any evidence that, you know, I, I've clogged filters as completely as I can clog them. They get worse. They don't get better, you right. know. The, the thing that people like to do is they like to think too much. And and the way they like to think about filters is, you know, if a, if a pool is cloudy today, you know, if you have a big pool party, you've got 150 people in a little bitty pool, they get out, it's going to look like bath water because that's essentially what it is. You know, that pool's going to be real cloudy, and it's not going to clear up quickly. It's going to take a while. Now, a person observing this may say, well, that filter didn't work worth a dime when I started, but, you know, after six or seven days, you know, it really is working good. So I bet all that dirt went in there and made it start working good. The The truth is, you know, the filter is going to work the same or, or worse, but it's only working at about 20% efficiency. Yeah. So if you're, if you're filtering 20% efficiency, it's going to take four or five, six or seven days before you can see the benefit. The filter's not getting better. It's getting worse. But it just looks like it's getting better because the water quality is looking better. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes we've got to train our brains to actually uh, see what, we, what we're what we seeing in the correct light versus just trying to interpret. Because lots of people have told me, oh, yeah, filters get better when they get dirty. Not so much. 
<laughs> you know, I won't say that never happens, but usually it's the opposite. Well, that and that that's an important myth, I think, that just got dispelled. I, that That's something I had always heard, and uh, I, you know, would never have known otherwise. It's just passed down. From yeah, the yeah, that, and that's how that's how a lot of a, a lot of our uh, education comes from. The things that I say are not necessarily a hundred percent correct. I, I don't say them because I made them up. I say them because I, I heard it in a class or I was taught it by somebody with more experience than me. So, right. Is, is there is there new yeah. technology, James? Like I'm, the funny part of the what I love about your presentation from a couple years ago is you talk about the fact that you could design a better filter and you could, you, could, you know, bring it to market yourself if you had the wherewithal to do so. You know, you talked about that in your presentation from Charleston. Have you ever like provided a design to somebody or is something to maybe design a better filter? Well, you know, I work with lots of companies yeah. um, uh, to, to test their products. And, you know, I frequently tell them, you know, I mean, th this is the performance. And you know this. This is what you can do to to make it better. I mean, I, I'm not I'm not shy about doing that. But the the truth is, if you make it more expensive than the cheapest thing on the market, people aren't going to pick it. You know, it, it's like people are having a contest to see how shitty a filter they can buy. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, you know, here's a four hundred dollar filter that's pretty good. I wonder if I could get one for three fifty. You know, I wonder if I get one for 300, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah you can, <laughs> but there's a reason it's 300, <laughs> you know, and, and that's the thing is un until people either change their goals yeah, or, you know, they change the standards as to what you can sell and, and, and install in a swimming pool, you know, I think you're going to be in that kind of catch 22 of cheaper filters exist. So, you know, I could make a filter that would work great. Uh, I could make all these filters work great, in fact. But, you know, if, I, if I'm doing this with a cartridge filter, for example, and I say, well, you're going to need two filter houses instead of one. You know, you're going to need two filter elements instead of one. And we may need to increase the size of the pump just a little bit because there's going to be more head loss through the filter. Well, damn, I just doubled the cost of the project. You know, right. there's no way I'm going to get that bid. There's no way I'm going to sell that product, you know, unless, you know, I mean, if you look at cars or hamburgers, you know, you can get a, a dollar hamburger or a $6 hamburger. You know, there's a difference. You yeah. know, some people want a $6 hamburger and some people want a $1 hamburger. And, uh, you know, but for some reason, you know, for swimming pools, people just want the $1 hamburger. You know, they want the cheapest thing they can find, and that's always going to be something that doesn't work. The one, the one area of the market that seems to drive things in, in our world is the high-end residential market, and mm -hmm. we're finding in that market that there is a real uh, interest and a real uh, quest for improving the water quality in these pools. People. Uh, in that world, don't have a problem spending ten to twenty thousand dollars on ozone systems, chemical automation, um, you know, very very high end water treatment systems, and very effective ones. Um, but I and I think if I had the uh, if I knew what to offer them in terms of filtration, let's say we could even take this thing up to a whole another level with, with the way that we filter the water. I, I think there would be a market for it. And, and then that sort of, once it takes a foothold in that market, then other people start looking at, you yeah. know, hey, I'd like to have that too. Well, there are companies that are, that are trying, to, trying to do, do better and learn better. And, um, you know, I'm, um, I'm working with, uh, with a company right now that's looking at uh, trying to make better filters. Uh, for pools that are that are going to remove pathogens efficiently, that are going to clear the water better and stuff. And so I, I think uh, you know maybe at the next uh, World Aquatic Health Conference uh, or maybe the next uh, uh, podcast I'm on with you guys, I, I may have some data and be talking about uh, a, kind of a new new model or type of filter that you could use in these high-end residential markets. 
So uh, I, I think new technology is on the way. Uh, I mean, we have ceramic membranes, but they're just, uh, you know, really expensive. Right. But, you know, if I were doing a high-end design, like, you know, somebody wanted a $20,000 ozone system, you know, I would probably say, well, you probably ought to throw in a $1,000 filter instead of a $500 one, you know. Right. And, you know, just by, you know, changing the media, changing the depth of the media, changing the flow rate, the numbers of filters, I mean, there's a lot you can do to make these filters more efficient. I mean, we, we know what works. It's just that that's not the minimum standard. That's not the cheapest option. Right. So, I mean, if you're not dealing with those people, uh, you know, that, that have to have the $1 hamburger, you know, I think you can do a lot. Yeah. Terrific. That's, that's good news, actually. That is good news. Absolutely. And Dave, so, maybe there's a, you know, and James, I don't know, what would you do? I mean, Dave, if you wanted to get a recommendation on something, would you be able to, do you think, figure that out? Or would you need to talk to somebody to try to figure out a recommendation on maybe a filter upgrade or something? That makes sense? Yeah, um, any, anything, maybe even if uh, uh, we could talk offline about that, maybe I'd, I'd yep. love to, <laughs> I'd love to get a little brain, science yeah. in the real world going out here. I would, I would try anything that was available right now. Yeah. I, I would pitch it, but uh, James, one thing well, I'd mean, love to read. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, if we just, uh, you know, if we just summarize, you know, really quickly, I mean, yeah. if you want to make a sand filter work, you know, you can add a, a, a polyaluminum chloride feed pump and, and feed that, you know, half a or a, a tenth of a part per million of aluminum. I mean, if you do that with 24 inches of media and a 10 gallon per minute per square foot loading rate, uh, you can make sand filters work magically well. You could do the same thing with uh, 24 inches of ultrafine ceramic. Uh, you could do the same with adding 50% more perlite and, and, and cleaning the filter on a regular basis, you know, not interrupting the flow, maybe using a variable speed pump so that the, the filter can flow all the time. You know, I mean, you have the affinity law uh, that, that helps you with, with variable speed pumps where, you know, if you cut the speed in half, you know, you cut the power by, you know, like a factor of six or eight. Um, and, and so, you know, just by slowing down the pumps, you make it to transition these pools to, you know, filter in 24 hours and then being good candidates for, for pre-coat. With pre-coat filters, you can use finer media. There's drinking water grades of, of filter media that work better than the pool grades, but the pool grades are fine as long as you use the right amount. You know, yeah. with cartridge filters, you know, you can use finer cartridges. So, I mean, there's absolutely ways that you can do things better and do them right now. And I don't think we should, you know, try to, try to keep that a secret. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm telling everybody I can, you know, how to filter better. Yeah. You, know, it, you don't have to. You don't have to pay me to tell you. Uh, I'll tell you. <laughs> That's great. Um, wh one thing I wanted to revisit from the uh, World Aquatic Health Conference presentation, uh, I was want a little more clarification on. It. You said something to the effect that there's a the, the actual quality of the water. Um, affects the filtration. You, you were talking about the NSF 50 test that was done in Michigan. You tried to duplicate it in, with your water in South Carolina and you came up with a completely different result. Can you uh, explain that to me? Sure, sure. So the, the first time, uh, you know, I mean, the, you know, I talk all the time about how bad the NSF 50 uh, test is for, for filters and it's because I've used it. And I mean, basically you, you make a water that looks like milk. I mean, this water is so white that you can't even see the bottom of the container. You can't see through clear pipes. I mean, this water looks like milk. And I mean, that's the test water. It's, it's 40 to 50 NTU. I mean, that's about 40 to 50 times dirtier than a pool would, would ever, that you'd ever swim in. <laughs> and, and they use particles that are extremely large that aren't gonna get removed at a proper efficiency and the test that's being run by labs all over the country doesn't control all the parameters. So it just says, you know, the turbidity has to be this and you have to use this type of material. So the first time I did it, I didn't add any hardness. I just put in tap water. I put in the, the, the same material that they use at NSF. You know, I made it look like milk and a NSF approved filter failed the test. So the first time I did this test, uh, an approved past filter failed the test in my lab. And I'm like, what the hell? 
So mm-hmm. I look up and find that Ann Arbor, Michigan tap water, where, where NSF is, actually has a lot of hardness in it. So uh, I match the hardness of the water by adding some, you know, calcium chloride. And once I match the hardness of the water, it would pass the test. But, you know, the, these people at NSF, they don't even understand how, the, how to make their own method fail. You know, they've probably got labs all over the country that are struggling with this, and it's because the standard sucks. You know, I mean, if you've got hardness that's going to make it fail or, or not fail based on what the local tap water is, I mean, you've got a pretty crap-ass method, mm-hmm. and that's, that's what NSF has. You know, so depending on where you have your filter tested by NSF, it may fail or pass, depending on what the local tap water is. You know, and that's that's ridiculous. All right. Yes. Um, one one more question about sand filters. The one the one thing in my experience that I've seen, um, it's it's very hard to to get them to backwash properly on some of the models because the va- the backwash valve itself is so restrictive that you can't get really enough flow to, to drive the uh, uh, the dirt out of the out of the media. Uh, it could be. I mean the, the battle that the manufacturer is trying to fight there is they're trying to keep the, the crazy homeowner from washing out all the media. <laughs> but what they're doing is they're keeping them from washing out the dirt, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if if it's restricted uh, by a valve or an orifice, uh, yeah, it could definitely be a problem. But chances are, if you're filtering and backwashing at the same rate for a sand filter, chances are that both those rates are wrong, you know. And that's another advantage of, of variable drive pumps is, you know, you could potentially backwash at a higher rate than what you normally operate at. And, and being able to control that without wasting all that energy is a real real thing. I mean, all the all the pumps in my lab have, have variable drives on them for that reason. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, if, if the filter design is poor uh, because they're trying to keep you from washing the media out, then yeah, you could get filters that you can't backwash. But even if it's not restricted, if you're, if you're backwashing at 15 gallons a minute per square foot or less, yeah, I would say you're you're doing a pretty shitty job of backwashing. All right. Yes. Well, uh, this was terrific. I, I yes. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this conversation. Uh, um, it's a, an area of uh, service and and uh, pool construction that I think uh, needs to be given more thought and more attention. Yeah. And and I I really appreciate the fact that you're out there doing doing the work, doing the science, and that you're, you're willing to bring that to us and, and uh, help us understand it a little bit. I really appreciate your time here today. Well, I really appreciate you all having me, and, and you're, you're 100% correct. I mean, we know how to filter better. We know how to filter pools better. We're just not doing it, you know, yeah. and, and I think in many ways until it's required to do better or until we find people that are just motivated to do better, you know, things aren't going to change very quickly. Right. But, but yeah, thank, thanks so you. much for having me today. Uh, and if I can we'd come love to back have you and on again, James. In the future. Yeah, we'll keep in touch because we'd love to have you on again if you have, you know, as you're doing research or things that we'd love to talk to you again in the future if that's possible. And, and it's good information and we think that the industry should definitely hear it. Absolutely. Thank you, Michelle. Have a thanks, great James. Thank you. We appreciate it. A new voice in the industry. A resource for all. Education for you. This is Pool Pro Podcast. Build relationships and share important news as we get ready for our next backyard adventure. Pool Pro Podcast. Backyard adventures are better together. Please take a moment to share, like, and review our content with all of those that would be interested.